The installation that we will show in this video is called the Wilberforce pendulum. It is a long spring with a load at the end, and this load can not only oscillate vertically, but also rotate. I'll pull the load down and let it go. Now it is swinging vertically up and down. But look, the load began to spin around the vertical axis, although I did not make it rotate this way. At the same time, the amplitude of vertical oscillations is getting smaller. Now it has reached zero. The load is rotating rapidly. Let's see what happens next. Now the amplitude of vertical oscillations is increasing again, and the rotation around the vertical axis, on the contrary, is slowing down. So we see pure vertical oscillations. But if we continue to observe the load a little longer, we will again see how the vertical oscillations turn into a rotation of the load around the vertical axis. But if you stop to think about it, this transition from vertical to rotational oscillations and back looks very strange. After all, the pendulum has a natural frequency of vertical oscillations, which is determined by the spring stiffness relative to its stretching and compression, and the mass of the load. And it has a frequency of rotational oscillations, which is determined by the torsional spring stiffness and the moment of inertia of the load relative to the vertical axis. And it seems that if we make the load move vertically, it will oscillate up and down and will not twist. On the contrary, if we spin it, there is no reason for it to start moving vertically. The fact is that in the Wilberforce pendulum, the mass of the load and its moment of inertia are specially selected in such a way that the frequency of vertical oscillations coincides with the frequency of rotational oscillations. This means that the spiral movements, which combine both vertical movement and rotation, will occur at the same frequency. But that's not all. The fact is that due to the spiral shape of the spring, vertical and rotational oscillations are connected. Let's assume that we started only vertical oscillations. When the load goes down, the spring gets stretched and because of this unwinds, and when the load goes up, the spring contracts and winds back. Due to this, the energy of vertical oscillations is gradually transformed into the energy of rotational oscillations. Conversely, let's assume that we started only rotational oscillations. When the spring unwinds, it gets stretched, and when the spring winds up again, it contracts. And now the energy of rotational oscillations is gradually transformed into the energy of vertical oscillations. As a result, the natural oscillations of the Wilberforce pendulum are not vertical and rotational oscillations at all, but to spiral oscillations, the left-handed and the right-handed ones. Let's take a look at them. To get such spiral oscillations, it is necessary both to pull the load and twist it. Their frequencies are slightly different. The frequency of the left-handed oscillation, the harsher one, is 0.82 Hz, and the frequency of the right-handed oscillation is 0.79 Hz, which is slightly less. And the difference between these frequencies is 0.03 Hz, which corresponds to a period of 33 seconds. We have already seen that the period during which vertical oscillations transform into rotational ones and vice versa is exactly 33 seconds. And now we will see why this happens. When we pull the weight down without twisting, we can assume that we start the sum of the left and right handed oscillations with opposite twists and the same amplitudes. And then each of these vibrations lives its own life and due to the fact that their frequencies do not coincide, they gradually diverge in phase. Let's draw graphs of vertical components in left and right-handed oscillations and find their sum. Where both oscillations occur in phase, they strengthen each other, and where they occur in the opposite phase, they weaken each other to zero. The rotational components at the start are in the opposite phase, Thus, their sum first increases from zero to the maximum and then decreases again to zero. 
So I've given you a qualitative explanation of the Wilberforce pendulum behavior. And this year participants of the International Tournament of Young Physicists are invited to study this device in detail. Let them do it. And I'm going to ask you our traditional final question. We've changed the pendulum's design a bit, moved its disks apart, and now I'm going to launch it and we'll see how it behaves. We see that the pendulum is trying to go into rotational oscillations, but their amplitude is very small. The question is, why is this happening? Write your thoughts on this in the comments to this video on YouTube.